Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of our podcast. And already this time, a special uh, edition, as you can see from the language that we're using. We are very honored to have uh, with us uh, as a guest, uh, Michael Humer, Professor Dr. Michael Humer, whose uh, book we've examined uh, thus far. You're going to see in the top left corner appear a link to the first uh, uh, chapter of the book where we did a general introduction of Dr. Humer. But just to run us through quickly, he is a philosophy professor, studied philosophy at Berkeley, California, and then did his doctorate at Rutgers. And today he's teaching at the University of Boulder in uh, Colorado, uh, sorry, the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's a published author. One of the books, one of the mo more influential books is uh, his uh, book on ethical intuitionism. The other one that we've discussed was uh, the problem with political authority. And now he has published uh, a new book of which uh, you'll probably tell us a few things at the end, which is called Understanding Knowledge. Dr. Humer, hello, and thank you for coming with <laughs> on our show. There we go, that's the book. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for uh, for coming. So uh, to start off with something that's a simple uh, question, it's one that our one of our colleagues who isn't here with us today would like to ask, and this just to set the tone and stuff like that. How would you define uh, libertarianism for both the learned and the unlearned? Well, yeah, so. I mean, if somebody actually doesn't know what it is, I guess I would explain it by describing some of the policy views. So, like libertarians tend to um, support smaller government. Most extreme libertarians are anarchists, but most of them just support a minimal government, meaning that, you know, the government should protect us from crime and from foreign invaders. And, you know, that's pretty much it, pretty much all they should do. And then, and, you know, so like uh, we don't need social welfare programs. We should drastically reduce government spending and taxes. You should have the right to do what you want with your with your own body and with your own life, as long as you're not interfering with other people. So, you know, like uh, prostitution should be legal. Recreational drug use should be legal. You should be able to uh, to own a gun, you know, uh, like, you know, like everybody in America. So, okay. And, you know, why, why do they think these things? And some, some libertarians give us sort of like a very strong theory about rights and how you're violating other people's rights whenever you, um, you know, when you make a law, you're threatening somebody with violence if they disobey this command. And so you're violating somebody's rights if you're threatening them with violence to stop them from doing something that is not itself a rights violation, right? So you can only use force against people to stop them from violating other people's rights. All right now, that's not really the way that I defend it. The way that I argue is, well, I think we should apply the same moral principles to the government that we apply to everyone else. So if I decided I was going to go around taking money from people by force, in order to give it to other people, you would say that was wrong, right? Like, you know, I just go to people on the street and I say, hey, I'm going to kidnap you and lock you in a cage unless you give me, you know, 20% of all of your income, right? <laughs> and, and But don't worry, I'm going to do some good things with it. I'm going to give some of that money to the poor and I'm going to give some of it to my friends and I'm going to use some of it to buy bombs and whatever. And anyway, you got to give me money. <laughs> like, you would say, well, that's theft. I would be an extortionist. And actually, the government would come and arrest me and lock me in jail for doing that. But that's what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like, my question is, why, why do they get to do that? Nobody else gets to do that. And I just don't think that there's any satisfactory answer to that. And there's no explanation of why they're special and they get to do things nobody else can do. Right, right. Well, you've spoiled the book, but it's a good thing this comes after we've already gone through it. <laughs> right. Is libertarianism the same thing as anarcho-capitalism? Or is it just an extreme version of libertarianism? Yeah, anarcho-capitalism is the most extreme form of libertarianism, like libertarian anarchy. 
I mean, the, the way that people arrive at this is, okay, so, you know, we all agree that everyone should have some kind of protection against criminals. Like, you know, there are murderers and rapists and thieves who, if there's nobody to stop them, they're just going to run rampant. So we all agree that somebody should be using force to stop them. And there's a disagreement among libertarians about whether that has to be the state. So the anarcho-capitalists think, oh, no, you could, um, you could fight crime by having private companies. We could privatize the police. And so there could be multiple competing security agencies. Okay. Yeah. Mainstream libertarians think that you need to have the state, right? The anarcho-capitalists think that you can privatize the police and so on. The mainstream libertarians, like the majority of libertarians, think for some reason that won't work out. And so you just have to have the government doing that. There's another definition, or should I say, conception about... Uh, let's, uh, sorry, let's take, for example, justice and the market-based justice. In anarcho-capitalism, there are many private centers of power. And then uh, you could have a community where drug use is criminalized and others, other communities, drug use is not criminalized. But uh, other communities will just respect the non-aggression principle and it don't, they don't uh, take into account uh, any market-based uh, arbitrage agency or other justice uh, institutions. And you could have a uh, an anarcho-capitalist uh, community that criminalize drug use, right? Yes. So, yeah, so, you know, like here's a real world example. I um I have a condominium which has a homeowners association and they were recently taking a vote on whether to ban smoking in that building. <laughs> and so um and you know, this is not marijuana smoking, this is just like tobacco smoking which is legal. <laughs> And they can do that. And they can do that because, well, it's a private organization and everybody voluntarily bought into the uh, condominium complex. So, and there's competition. There are other condominium complexes that you can live in and apartments and houses and whatever. Um, and so like, you know, like the libertarian view doesn't stop a private organization from making intrusive rules. Um, but it is important that there's competition and there's a voluntary agreement and government is not like that. And so because the, because the government is not like that, because there's no competitor and they force you to belong to their organization, that means that they're obligated to have the most permissive rules. Like they, you know, they can't ban doing stuff with your own body. And given that they're forcing you to belong to their organization. I see. Okay. Yeah, that, that would make sense. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the origin story behind the uh, intuitional ethics? Because this book is also sort of uh, the one we've discussed, sort of oh, yeah, seems okay. to be grounded yeah. in uh, intuitions a lot. Yeah. Like you, you. Yeah, here's this book. Right. Buy my book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's the origin? I mean, um, like I, I read about intuitionism in college. So, you know, the, like I had a college class in which we read W.D. Ross's book, The Right and the Good. And when I first read it, you know, my reaction was, oh, he's just like saying whatever arbitrary thing he wants to say and then calling that an intuition. And I, you know, like <laughs> he doesn't have any argument for his ethical beliefs, so he's just <laughs> just going to say it. But I, I don't really know why I thought that. <laughs> so... You know, later, after I thought about more, I realized that he was right. And so, I mean, you kind of, so you have to think about, yeah, how do we know, how do we know what's right and wrong? And it, it's not reasonable to say, oh, we never know. We have no idea. Like, you know, can you, can you murder children for fun? Who knows? <laughs> no, that's not a, that's not a reasonable position. Like, obviously, I know that that's wrong. So you think about that, and then there has to be well, like with everything else, there has to be uh, some foundational propositions. 
Right. Meaning like it can't be that everything that you know in that area comes from an argument from something else because that that's an infinite regress. So there have to be some starting things that you know that are self-evident. Right. And so like what Ross did, what the intuitionists generally do is, well, they take some elements of common sense morality, like things that just seem kind of obvious to everyone about what's right and wrong. And they say, so that's foundational. Sort of axiomatic um, in a way. Yeah, right. But I mean, I don't. So like the way that people use the word axiom or axiomatic is maybe ambiguous. I'm not saying that these are, you know, like incorrigible. Right. Like, I'm not saying that you're not allowed to argue against it or whatever. Right. Um, I'm saying this is something that seems to be true. So it makes sense to assume this is correct unless we have specific reasons against it. All right. right. So, and you know, you would say yeah. that would be an intuition, right? It's yeah. Like we, we see it, it, it. It appears as being true. Therefore, since we don't have any reason to to doubt it and we've looked hard enough, we can in, intuitively say it's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you think, you think of things like, well, okay, so I sh if you make a promise, you should generally keep it. You should generally not tell lies. You should generally not steal other people's stuff. You shouldn't um, attack people. You shouldn't, like, hurt people. You know, all, so all of these things are, like, generally true. And any normal person, if you say these things, they will have the reaction that that seems right. And so unless we have a specific reason for doubting these things, you should you should assume that they are correct, right? Which is my general view about um, all kinds of knowledge, right? We should assume the world is the way that it seems unless and until we have specific reasons for doubting that. And do you think that... Uh... Rothbard or others that uh, base their political views on property. Uh, it's a less uh, strong argument for ANCAP. Oh, um, so um, who did you refer to? Rothbard, Murray Rothbard. Rothbard. Murray Rothbard. Oh, okay. Well, I think it's a less strong argument if you take like... Um, a very strong view okay so like rothbard apparently has a view that you can just tell a priori that property rights are inviolable right so you know and like the libertarian slash locking conception of property is just um self-evident and unrevisable and you can never violate somebody's property rights no matter what like if that's your view i think you have a weaker defense of anarcho-capitalism because almost everyone is going to think that's obviously false <laughs> if you're if you start from a starting point that almost everyone other than you and the other libertarians finds obviously false then you're not giving a very very good defense and so like a lot of people are going to say well obviously property rights are not absolute so now i can ignore the rest of this person's argument right which i think really is like underselling libertarianism because i don't think that it depends upon such strong assumptions right like like i don't think that it depends on the assumption that you can never violate property rights okay so you think they have to work harder at uh, arguing every every position that they uh, hold instead of being uh less uh, yeah well, I mean, I mean, you can say, oh, I have like this self-evident axiom. And then so like, it's, it's not exactly that they're, they're not exactly going to work harder. They're going to work less hard, <laughs> but, but it's going to be less convincing because you took this axiom, which is like a really strong claim. And then you're, you're saying that it's self-evident. And so then, so now you don't have to work that hard because you could deduce like a really strong conclusion from it. You can like pretty much so if you assume oh it's always wrong to initiate force against somebody you know who's not violating rights then you can get anarchism from that pretty straightforwardly okay but the problem is like it's just not very persuasive to normal people because why would i believe that that's always wrong no matter what right like okay so like you wouldn't steal a dollar to save the world 
Like if if somehow you could save the rest of the world from being destroyed by stealing one dollar, you know, would that be permissible? <laughs> and like, you know, if you're Rothbard or Ayn Rand, apparently you say, no, you can't do that. It's like, <laughs> that's an initiation of force. It's a violation of rights. And like, but if you're a normal person, you would say, well, obviously, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure that that's what they would say. I think they would say, well, you've got two evils, right? You'd be breaking yeah. an, an ethical rule either way, yeah. right? Like you c- could prevent the entire world and yourself from being eliminated. Therefore, you could act in self-defense. And the only way to do that is to steal a dollar, which is, again, an, an immoral yeah. act, right? But you've got <laughs> one. We've got two choices. You're going to weigh them rationally and uh, steal the bloody dollar. <laughs> well, where are I don't think they'd say the last part. No, so, but, I, but I'm so, saying they they would accept that it's a it's a violation, right? But yeah. when you're when you're faced with, you're right. Maybe they wouldn't tell you what to do in case of two wrongs, right? But maybe that's yeah, I mean, outside the scope. Well, no, but but like in in a very doctrinaire libertarian view, it's not two wrongs. There's only one wrong. Stealing is wrong. Failing to save people isn't wrong. So, right? Because they don't believe in positive rights, right? Right. So, well, you would be also saving yourself in the process, right? And yeah, I mean, your property I, too. Well, let, let me <laughs> the destruction. Of let the me world modify would think it about the destruction of your property. Yeah, let me modify it. Okay, you okay. can save the entire rest of the human race except for yourself and the person who owns the dollar if you steal one dollar. <laughs> okay, so uh, you steal the dollar. Yeah, if you don't steal the dollar, then you and that one other person survive. You do steal the dollar, everyone survives. <laughs> okay. So do you steal the dollar? Right. To save right. you know, then, the then, eight then I billion other no. people. Right. Doc, doc, right. no, speaking, you're right. I think they, they right. And, and like, you know, so I have talked to a fair number of libertarians in my life, other than myself. Uh I've talked to myself too. But anyway, I talked to a fair number of libertarians and I have a sense that, oh, okay, so like a certain number of them, they would start to try to weasel. <laughs> Right. They would not right out say, no, you can't do it. Let everyone else die. But they also would not straight out say, oh, yeah, you can override property rights because they don't want to say either of those things. Um, so, you know, they would start to say, um, you could steal the dollar and then pay it back later. Yeah. And, you know, like later you can compensate them. I'm like, oh, OK, wait, are you saying that it's permissible to violate rights if you plan to compensate someone later? no right if you like, okay well it was impermissible but you could still like you could still try to make up for it well okay if you had to advise somebody what to do in that situation would you tell them to steal the dollar it's like oh. <laughs> i mean if your theory says that it's morally wrong then that means you should tell them don't steal the dollar right and let everybody else die like okay you know, like, what's so bad about stealing a dollar? It's not that bad. Like, I don't know. Okay, it's bad, but it's only a little bit bad. What's your view about the strategy that libertarians and uh, ANCAPs would use in uh, promoting a ANCAP society in light of the recent elections? For example, many, the Libertarian Party in USA had a modest success these days and the uh, best they could do was uh, force a runoff in georgia i think and uh, was it, is it better to just uh, concentrate on uh, promoting books podcasts or uh, writing articles and stuff like that instead of promoting uh, politics and uh, accepting to washington well I mean, basically, I think we should have a variety of people pursuing a variety of strategies. So I'm happy that there are political activists who are running for public office and trying to get elected, although they pretty much never do get elected. <laughs> but, you know, maybe just like their presence has some influence, you know, because it's like, yeah, like a libertarian candidate can't actually win any major office, but they can be spoilers for, you know, one of the other parties. So that could exert some influence, right? Because like, if the 
Republicans and the Democrats are too unlibertarian, then a certain percentage of voters will vote libertarian, which will could potentially cause one of them to lose to the other one to the other one, right? But so um so you know like there could be some movement you could maybe push the Republicans a little bit to the libertarian side so that they can you know avoid the spoiler effect of the libertarians. Now, you know, like I'm not interested in doing this. I'm not interested in like running for public office or anything like that. I think I would do even less well than other libertarians. And, you know, like I would do less well than the libertarian candidates who have gotten one or two percent of the vote or whatever, because I would probably be more honest and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. And less friendly i don't kiss that many babies <laughs> whatever <laughs> so anyway uh, i mean my my overall strategy is like this is a really long-term thing right like the plan for making society more libertarian that's going to take decades or centuries yeah. and the plan is well we have to like change the philosophical beliefs of the culture which is going to take a long time but you know, like that's that's why I have these books that you're talking about, right? right. Going back to the book, uh, in your book, you seem to be uh, optimistic in the sense that uh, you say it's likely that uh, an un an ANCAP society could emerge if it's surrounded by liberal democracies. You sort sort of hint to that. Has your view of this uh, been? Uh, dimmed in any way by the recent uh, responses to the national threat that was the COVID uh, situation by so-called liberal democracies? Oh, uh, no, not really. I mean, you know, so war has become much less popular. It's less popular in liberal democracies than right. in dictatorships. <laughs> and so um, now, you know, when you have things like the um, the pandemic and, you know, there will be future diseases. So, you know, this will happen again. And that that does lead that could lead the government to do things like trying to lock down their society, but they're not going to invade another society to try to lock them down. OK, but, you know, some some of the governments did things like um, shutting down travel in and out of the country. Right. And so. I yeah, think like Japan's in, just reopened like a, a couple of weeks ago. So they, they, they've been yeah, down okay. since it's fairly, fairly extreme. Yeah. Right. And so like they could try to close down the border. So if there was an anarchist society that um, all these governments would have tried to shut down the border with that society, but they would not have invaded it. Right. And they wouldn't have tried to force that society to lock down internally. They would have just tried to keep them out. Okay. So you say that the, uh war is less uh, probable to appear in uh, liberal democracies so that's why these uh, societies would be more inclined to get to ancap in the future why not yeah, uh, well, monarchy or let's say uh, i don't know oligarchy yeah, I mean, well, my idea was um, how can a how can an anarcho-capitalist society be stable um, in the face of other societies that are not anarchist? Right. And so, if everyone the in the world, threat. right? Yeah, right. if everyone in the world is anarchist, no problem. You know, there will be no wars because there won't be any governments to have the war. But if one society is anarchist and there are other societies with governments, you know, why won't the governments invade the anarchist society? Right. And so the answer to that is well. The world is headed towards democracy like the so about half the world is democratic and that number has increased like dramatically over the last two centuries and at some point it will be all of the world will be democratic and democratic countries don't like going to war so even if there was an anarchist society you know surrounded by all these government societies uh if the governments are democratic they would not want to attack the anarchist society and yeah and basically because yeah, you know, why do countries like to attack other countries anyway? Well, it's because the dictator wants more power, right? But like the ordinary people, they don't want to go to war. <laughs> it's like whatever, people get killed. They don't. They don't want 
their own people to be killed and they don't really feel like killing somebody else <laughs> and it's like and there's nothing in it for them they're not getting any more power so like it's just not popular to go to war unnecessarily right uh so maybe i uh, misframed the question originally it was sort of along this line of the world is going to to democracy and uh, that's that was my question basically do you think that this pandemic has shown I'll get into the good effects afterwards, but my question was, do you think that this pandemic has shown that perhaps we're not as liberal as we thought we may have been, basically? I oh, mean, uh, uh, or or that the people are, have internalized freedoms. liberalism rather than... Yeah, maybe. I mean, it might show that our, um, you know, sort of commitment to liberalism was skin deep. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, basically, like, what struck me about it was the polarization like it immediately became politicized so like if you're a republican then you have to think covid is not bad or right like if it, you know if it's not a complete hoax it's at least not so bad it's like the flu or whatever and then you know masks don't work and vaccines are dangerous and then if you're a democrat you have to think all the opposite of these and like if you're a really strong democrat you're still wearing a mask okay and like it was just like yeah just like all along party lines yeah now i mean the way that people were port portraying it you like it well it would make sense to shut down whatever you know shut down most of our trade if this is a really deadly disease that's going to kill you know whatever half of the society or something like that Right. So like at the beginning of the whole pandemic, when we didn't know how bad it was going to be, it made sense to be cautious and you know, say, OK, you know, let's try to avoid unnecessary contact or whatever. Right. But, you know, it just kept going on, like the lockdown situation kept going on after we knew that, like, whatever, you know, it was only going yeah. to kill. Yeah. yeah one percent or something well the good news uh, as i said that there is a good side to all of this is that virtually everywhere in the world uh, trust in governments has plummeted after this right. mishap so at least that's favorable to us too <laughs> and Caps. yeah i mean well yeah like is trust good or bad well it depends on whether the object is trustworthy or not <laughs> so, well yes and okay. if so if the government is untrustworthy then we shouldn't trust it but if they're trustworthy we should but okay but the thing is like you say oh it's an advantage that people trusted the government less but that's only because it it was untrustworthy right so it's not it's not good that it was untrustworthy well well it's not yeah. good that it was there to begin with yeah. but <laughs> yeah 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 at least this would help uh, what, what i'm saying is that maybe this would help the average person to sort of like open that door and look at government with skepticism basically yeah. the be willing yeah, I mean, to entertain the arguments in the problem with political no authority. that's right i mean i have to say like if you wanted to explain why you shouldn't trust the government too much like there's way more stuff there's way worse stuff <laughs> that happened you know, like, true true like, i i think like a lot of americans are not aware that we sent japanese americans these are american citizens of japanese ancestry to concentration camps world war ii yeah during world war ii like um i don't know like best president in u.s history right yeah <laughs> at least in yeah like a hero i think he's a hero of the quote liberals yeah, <laughs> like exactly that's the guy sending people to concentration camps what society do you think that uh libertarianism will occur first small states mm -hmm. like monaco andorra or local governments or well, well, what do you? Think? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, it's like it might turn out to be a society that we just that you never hear about, you haven't thought of. It'll just be some small place. Some libertarians are thinking about starting, like starting their own city. Okay, so like some people are trying to make charter cities where you would make an agreement with the government of some country to not interfere, and then you start up a city there you know which would be like a libertarian city mm -hmm. and then you know there's like this idea of patrick friedman that he's trying to get to happen of seasteading where you create a community in the ocean in international waters 
So, you know, maybe that will happen. I mean, I like, I keep thinking that maybe this will happen in the United States in some, you know, not in the whole United States, but in a small part, like there will be some particularly libertarian area where like the city will say, hey, we want to have our own, you know, se separate libertarian thing. And the main problem is they have to convince the government of the larger region to not interfere with them. Right. But, you know, maybe sometime that that could happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, think about the way um, as a, like just a small and a small scale event. Think about how uh, Colorado legalized marijuana, even though it's illegal at the federal level. And, uh, and then a bunch of other states started doing this. And like they don't have any power to repeal the federal law, so it is still technically illegal, but it is de facto legal. Because right, so Colorado will not enforce that law, and then the federal government, uh, for some reason, agreed not to interfere. So they're not going to arrest you for marijuana violations either. Mm -hmm. So you know, like maybe we you could get something like that happen on a sort of more extensive scale, or I think mean, not in a not more extensive like as in larger region, but more laws or laws yeah. repeal. Right. Yeah. But uh, for example, uh, regarding taxation, you have city taxes, county, state or, and federal taxes, right? Yeah. In USA, uh, can a state uh, nullify the federal taxes for? Uh, oh, uh, well, the federal government is not going to allow that because yeah. they want their money. <laughs> they just want money. But um, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you know, nothing you can do about that. But uh, you might be able to like get around federal regulations or things like that. I mean, like I, so you know, like the the federal taxes are a lot, and like they're taking a huge amount of the economy, but they're probably not the worst thing that the government is doing. <laughs> like the burden of regulation might be larger than the burden of taxes. Yeah, at this point, you, you do mention something about the size and scope of the, of the uh, <laughs> regulations, the, the yeah. home of federal regulations. Yeah, which yeah, I, tried like... to, I tried to look up and I have no idea what the number of pages has gotten to since the book, which is because uh, now it's all online. So I, I, unless yeah, you yeah. have a printed version, I don't think you can... You can still use yeah. that measurement. You can say two or three terabytes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, Archived. I, like when I read the book, there was 150,000 pages in the Code of yeah. Federal Regulations. And um, yeah, this is like, this isn't a book. This is like a bookcase. Right? <laughs> and uh, it was like, it was 20,000 pages when it started, which is already pretty long, <laughs> 20,000 pages. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, every year we discover like thousands of pages, more regulations that we need. I mean, so yeah. well, what are the odds? What are the odds that a person whose life, whose livelihood depends on writing up regulations comes up with new ones? Yeah. 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 You, you know, you got to do something, right? Like if that's your job, you're a regulator. You got to do something with your time. You can't just sit there doing nothing. So you got to write some more regulations. Right. Tell us a little bit about the new book. Oh, um, wait, this one. Yes. Everybody should go buy it. Yeah, um, well, you know, I wrote this partly because, so I teach epistemology periodically. Although, you know, you might know me as a political philosopher. Um, I've done more epistemology, like, you know, in my academic work than anything else. And, um, okay, so, you know, when I teach epistemology, like, I want, I want to have a textbook for it. And actually, there aren't good. Well, there's a there's a bunch of books that you can use, right? But there aren't <laughs> books. There aren't any books that have exactly what I want. Until now, right? I realize that to have a book that covers all of the things that I want and covers them, you know, like in a clear and concise way, I have to write it. So, right. So that's what happened. So now I'm going to use it for my own classes, and I hope that some other people will use it. But so the idea is, well, it's an it's an introduction to the theory of knowledge, right? So what do we know? What is knowledge? Right. Do we really know the things we think we know? And how do we know them? And under what conditions is a belief justified? You're like, what is the right way of forming beliefs? Those sorts of questions. Right. Okay. So I got some great endorsements, you know, on, that I put on the back of the book. And um, you can, 
you can do things like this if you publish the book yourself, okay? If you go to a traditional publisher, you can't get such great endorsements. So, you know, Erasmus says, when I get a little money, I buy Mike Humor's books. If any is left, I buy food and clothes. That's a real <laughs> quotation, except I inserted Mike Humor's at course, a certain yeah. point. In the- <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then this is also a real quotation with a slight addition <laughs> from Immanuel Kant. Thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. And students without Mike Humor's books are dumb. Okay. <laughs> Uh, from from Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am, also by Humor's books. So also a real quotation with a slight modification. By me. Well, with endorsements like that from the greatest philosophers, I'm sure the book yeah. uh, will sell like hotcakes. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I want to, lastly, I want to touch about uh, a scenario, a lifeboat scenario. You have uh, a few of them in the in chapter seven of your book. And I'll go uh, for the audience real quick through one of it. And it says like this, uh, there's a boat and a few people are in it and the boat takes water. And one of them, in order to save everybody, (laughs) has a gun and takes it out and says, Use use the uses uses the gun as a coercion mean, and then says everybody start bailing water. And uh, you then draw the conclusion that the state could use the force uh, in order to save a crisis, but that force has to be limited in time, has to be uh, specific and uh, content dependent not yeah do whatever he pleases yeah yeah i want to change a bit this scenario and say what if on the boat there's the owner of the boat that uh, bought it or built it with his own with his own hands and he says well you know we could save everybody if we can just take some pauses from time to time, it'd still be okay. And the one with the gun says, no, no pauses. Everybody just stopped <laughs> bending out water. And uh, sh- who should, uh, the people in the boat, who should listen to? The, the owner uh, or who has well, more legitimacy? In I mean, you know, it depends. Um can you take a few pauses <laughs> or so basically the yes sink? uh the, yeah. the the only the difference would be that the solution that's proposed by the owner is just less optimal because by taking pauses you let more water into the boat which is going to have to be bailed out so basically there's more effort into into the whole idea yeah right well so both but both, both solutions but both solutions end up saving the boat yeah <laughs> okay yeah well i mean you know, like who should you listen to? Well, I don't know. You you don't want to get shot, so you better listen to the guy with the gun. <laughs> but you know, the guy with the gun should probably, you know, he should probably relax a little bit. Right? Um, so, you know, like the guy with the gun, he's deciding like how much to coerce people. Well, he should only coerce people the minimum amount necessary to save the boat, right? So, if somebody wants to take a rest for a while, he should he should not he should not threaten them, you know. Right. As long as it's not actually threatening the boat. So basically, the uh, the the guy with the coercion would be overreaching if he were to say no, no, no breaks. Right. Then yeah. then the coercion would become illegitimate or unjustified. Yeah, that seems right. And okay, so that's because and and is it is it accurate to say what we've uh, sort of interpreted from this is that. So obviously this is legitimate for for the guy with the gun, right? So, but the question is, is that guy a stand-in, an actual correct stand-in for the state? So basically if the state were to just, I got no part of anything, I don't care about anything, all you people just do free trade, whatever, no regulations, uh, justice is dispensed. So basically... Anarcho-capitalist, but there's this guy in the corner who has a lot of guns, 
And uh, when the asteroid comes, he says, okay, now everybody start digging. We're going to build a nuclear bomb and a yeah. shuttle and <laughs> save the world or or whatever. Yeah, or, yeah. or 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 to, to tie it back to your example, he says, uh, he points the gun at my head and says, steal the damn dollar. You're going to save the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, like the purpose of the analogy was... Um, it's sort of like an analogy to public goods problems, but, um, you know, it's for people who think that um, government is needed to prevent a collapse of society or something, right? And then they would say, because of that, it's permissible to establish a government, right? And then I would say, so if that's true, then it is permissible, but the government should still only do the minimum that's necessary to prevent the collapse of society. Right. And like, why would society collapse? Well, like, you know, sometimes they say, oh, well, like foreign countries will invade and kill right. us. And then or like there will just be this there'll be rampant crime everywhere. Right. Like, you know, the Hobbesian state of nature or whatever. So, OK, so if that's true, then you have to have a, a minimal state. And, um, if that yeah, were so, true. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, and, you know, like your scenario of the asteroid that's coming to get us, like that would be a legitimate example for like when the government should steal money in order to stop, in order to create an asteroid defense system. Right. But if uh, in the case of the asteroid, let's say uh, some uh, multimillionaire who's uh, dabbled in selling electric cars has a, a, a rocket system in place and can acquire a nuclear bomb from the black market or whatever, then the government should should step back down because we have a non-coercive alternative that would solve the problem or that yes. would at least present the same probability of solving said problem. Well, yeah, but I mean, I, well, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm not sure that um, private individuals, I'm not sure Elon Musk should be allowed to have a nuclear bomb. So, <laughs> I mean, if he has something that can only be used as an asteroid defense, that's cool. But I'm not sure we should let him have something that could also be a method of destroying an entire city if he felt like it. Right. And, you know, you say, OK, well, like, I don't know. I don't think that he would decide to destroy a city. But if there's a small risk, you know, given the magnitude of the costs, I think like we're justified in using force to stop someone from having a nuclear bomb. I don't know, but uh... Based on my intuitions, I think it's a less probability that Elon Musk would use the bomb to erase a city than the government, I think. Yeah. That's <laughs> the government did it twice, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, US <laughs> government destroyed two cities with nuclear bombs. No one else has ever done that. The US <laughs> government, by the way, invented nuclear bombs, which no one else has ever done. <laughs> right. Um and well, they're going they to Technically, the Russians say they've invented them as well. So yeah, I know they stole the the idea, but yeah, yeah. But um, well, uh, yes, that's true. And so it would be ideal if no one had nuclear bombs. <laughs> but that's sort of not really feasible. Yeah, that, right? that that might be a case of Pandora's box now. And yeah, um, I mean, so. Like, you know, do I want the U.S. government to give up all its nuclear bombs? So, no, not unless we can also get the Russians to give up all of theirs and the Chinese. Like, if we can get everyone to give them up, great. <laughs> but I don't think we should unilaterally disarm. Right. But if everybody would give them up, what would stop this uh, rogue uh, state uh, from somewhere, let's say, in Africa? Right, an expansionist rogue African state that has access yeah. to rare earth minerals and so on. Although I, I'm not sure. I think the uranium that's mined is not precisely coming from Africa. But in any case, let's yeah. assume it is. What would stop one of these states from developing one? If yeah. everybody would well, give them up. So basically that, that would be the question. Right. Well, yeah. you can you can I mean, give up the the property, the right, the physical objects, you can destroy them, annihilate them, but I, I don't think you can make the knowledge disappear. disappear. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, well, what's stopping that now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, I don't know. Like basically, people would say sanctions and the fear of getting bombed by the U.S. Yeah. 
I mean, there's a few things like one is, well, it's actually not that easy. So like, True. and you know, like the African states probably don't have enough money and they don't have enough expertise. Also, though, if somebody starts a nuclear bomb program, then the U.S. government, among other things, will try to stop them, right? Right. right. But, you know, like, uh, well, you know, occasionally somebody like North Korea does build a nuclear bomb. And actually, by doing that, they rendered themselves safe from invasion by the U.S. <laughs> like, so, like, actually, that was, it was kind of smart, <laughs> like, kind of smart to make the nuclear bomb. But anyway, like, but I mean, what's stopping countries from building nuclear bombs is not that we have nuclear bombs. <laughs> like, it's like, we're not going to nuke a country in order to stop them from building a nuclear bomb. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, we would use conventional means. Yeah. Right. I, I've watched you on this uh, podcast uh, recently that you've done, and you uh, have alluded to the idea of... Uh, uh, libertarian free will that you ascribe to and you say that uh, in the course of that you realize that you have to be a mind body dualist in order to do in order to do that my question would be if you are uh, uh, if you are ascribing to those to both of those ideas where would you sit on the uh, eternal question dilemma rather can you sell yourself into slavery <laughs> oh um well, I'm not sure how that's connected to mind-body dualism. Well, uh, because it would be your body that gets sold. Uh, but uh, the body is the property, is your property, and uh, you want to sell it because you have control over it. Right. Well, that's, okay. the, that's, <laughs> the, that's the usual okay. framing of the, of the idea. I mean, I think, like, if you could transfer to another body, if you could transfer your soul to another body, then it would be cool to sell your original body. <laughs> but that's not the usual no. scenario, right? You know, selling yourself into slavery, you're selling the whole person, right? Like, because, you know, the slave master tells you to do stuff and, like, he can, he doesn't, like, completely control your mind. But, like, you have to decide to do the things that he tells you. So you're sort of, like, also, you're sort of also selling your mind, right? But anyway, okay. <laughs> um can you sell yourself into slavery? Mm -hmm. I don't, but I don't know. I guess, like, I guess I think you can make that contract and nobody should interfere with you making that contract. But I also don't think third parties should enforce that contract. <laughs> so, right, like, I don't know if I was the judge. So, like, if you sell yourself into slavery and then you just keep obeying your master then there's never any problem. Yeah, of course. There's only a problem if after doing that, you say, you know what, I want to take this back. And so I'm not going to obey master anymore. And then the master says, well, you have to obey me. And then he tries to get the government or somebody to enforce that, right? So like he calls the police or he files a lawsuit against you or something like that. So then the practical question becomes, should the police come and try to force you? to keep obeying the master. <laughs> right, right. So then I I guess my intuitive reaction is no, they shouldn't. Um, and, you know, like if the master sues you in court, should, should the court rule in his favor and like order you to do whatever he says? And my reaction to that is probably not. But, uh, you know, that's just like an intuitive reaction. I don't have like much of an argument for that. It just sort of seems like I don't my if I was the third party, I wouldn't want to get into that. It's like, doesn't, I don't know, you know, like in, the, in American law, there's a doctrine known as the unconscionability doctrine, whereby the government refuses to enforce contracts that it considers unconscionable. And um, this is basically contracts where the terms are so lopsided that it's like, you know, like one side, it's just, to it was totally unreasonable for them to accept the contract, right? And like, it's just like totally favoring the other side. And then the government will just not enforce it. Mm. And so like, so that doesn't prevent you from making the contract. And if both parties abide by it, then the government doesn't interfere with it. <laughs> right? But if somebody sues to have it enforced, then they won't enforce it. Right. So would you say then that in a in an ANCAP society, this something akin to this unconscionability doctrine would be baked in in order to sort of 
yeah. get as many people on board, basically? Well, um, it might it might be that some arbitrators would accept it and others would not, because um, there is a difference of opinion about that. Like some people don't agree with that, and they think you should enforce the contract anyway. So uh, yeah, I mean, it would depend on market demand or something. Mm. Basically, the yeah. So the arbitrators, so the arbitrators in the anarcho capitalist society are the substitutes for judges in government courts, right? Right. And so there's a, there'd be competing arbitrators. And basically, they would try to make decisions according to what they thought were the values of the community that they're from. And why they would do that is, well, they want third parties who observe how they resolve the case to think that they did a good job. They want to do that because they want other people in the future to come to them. <laughs> like when, when two parties have a dispute in the future, they want those two parties to think, you know, like here's somebody with a good reputation, right? Here's somebody who's respected. So let's go to them. Right. And so like what the doctrines would be that they would accept, including whether they would accept the unconscionability doctrine kind of depends upon how they assess the values of our society. So they, I don't know, like my sense is that this doctrine is, you know, like pretty, pretty in accord with our values. I'm like probably it's a, it's probably a small minority of people who think you should enforce any contract, however unreasonable it is. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think that that should be it. We've uh, taken advantage of your time quite uh, quite extensively. Thank you again for Thank you. Uh, accepting to, to discuss with us. Uh, we will take a look at the book, or at least I will. I promise to do that. And uh, we'll maybe... <laughs> come back uh, at some other point to discuss it if and when that could uh, could happen so thank you again dr homer for uh, yep. for taking the time with us okay oh yeah thanks for having me it's been great bye bye bye, -bye. bye.